All right, welcome everybody to uh, Vernal Pools of Maine. We are here tonight and joined by a couple of our wildlife biologists, Philip de Menadier and Becca Steadily. And they are two wildlife biologists who work with uh, vernal pools here in Maine, as well as non-game non and endangered species. So they're going to be talking to us tonight about some of the work they do with vernal pools and about vernal pools. And then at the end, we will be taking questions. So as we go along, if you want to use the chat function and go ahead and write in your questions, we'll answer some of those at the end. So I'm going to turn it over now to you, Philip, to go ahead and get us started. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Laura. Let's see here. All right, those looks like a nice, exciting picture of a vernal pool. <laughs> Very good. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, this is, this is kind of exciting because it's hard to get the timing just right, especially when you plan talks, you know, weeks or months ahead of time. But vernal pool season is upon an, a big part of Maine right now as we speak. Southern, especially central Maine, is um, very active vernal pool activity. And you'll, you'll see what I mean here shortly. So what we thought we'd talk about is you know, just let's just get everybody on the same page as to what a vernal pool is. It almost seems like we don't need to do that anymore, which is amazing when you think about it, because when we started giving talks on vernal pools 20 years ago, you know, we'd enter a room and um, we'd ask how many people had an idea or an inkling or a vision for what a vernal pool is when we mentioned that term. And maybe, you know, two or three hands would go up and that's it out of a room of dozens and dozens and now it's sort of the opposite and that's because there's been a lot of outreach and a lot of attention both scientific and and public on vernal pools so it's it's pretty neat how much um, attention they're getting with that said it doesn't hurt to just get a few parameters squared away because frankly if you ask a bunch of vernal pool ecologists to give you an academic definition of a vernal pool you're going to get a whole bunch of different answers but they sort of come down to these three or four, uh, these two or three items, th these, the three top items, which is that most vernal pools are small depressions in the landscape, um, almost always less than an acre, far less than an acre often. They are uh, seasonal, meaning that and, uh, they dry out because they don't have any permanent stream connection to another permanent water body. You know, they might have an intermittent channel flowing in or out, but no permanent stream surface connection. So they're isolated and they're shallow and they're small. And as a result, they, they tend to dry out by mid to late summer because they're filled up with snow and rain in the spring. And then there's really very little other inputs um, for water. And so as a result of drying out, they're, they have a really unique quality, which is unlike any other really wetland in Maine. And that is that they're fishless. They're not only fishless, they don't have a lot of predators of any kind. They don't, there's not, the, the density of invertebrate predators, it tends to be lower than say in a marsh or a swamp or a, a pond. And, and this, as you're gonna about to see is really important. Um, and especially for the main indicator species that you see here at the bottom, they're you know, wood frogs, spotted salamanders, blue spotted salamanders and fairy shrimp colorful names for a colorful crew are all uh, really closely tied to vernal pools. And let's just get a few uh, images of vernal pools squared away. This is sort of your classic image, um, sort of a depressional puddle in the woods, if you will, uh, some people refer to it. And it's an isolated upland pool, no streams, nice hardwood forest around it. And that is indeed a really nice example of a vernal pool, but they come in other, uh, other types in other settings. So here there's a vernal pool in a floodplain in a silver maple hardwood floodplain. You can see ostrich fern growing in the foreground. And this is on the Sebastocook River and it's mostly getting water as an overflow during spring high flood events. But nonetheless, it has all the other qualities, no other permanent connect connection once this, the, the, the river retreats and 
if there are fish, they're temporary populations. They're not really a sustainable permanent population of fish. Now getting a little more complicated is uh, basically what, you know, a lot of people would just call a shrub swamp. And that would be an accurate name. That means, a, you know, a depressional water body that's dominated by woody shrubs. And they can get kind of complicated because you, as you can see here, you get a mosaic of alder and winterberry and button bush and leather leaf and other things sort of scattered about. But nonetheless, it still meets all of the criteria for a vernal pool. This thing will dry out by late summer, no permanent stream connected to it and no fish. And then the one that, the type that often gets overlooked, but we have a lot of here in Maine, just because we have a lot of forested wetlands, are our forested swamp pools. You know, a, a you know, forested swamp versus a shrub swamp is just as it suggests that it's the, the woody vegetation tends to be canopy vegetation versus just shrubs. And, and you know, not all forested swamps are vernal pools, but they many of them have a depressional component to them at one end of the swamp where Again, water will accumulate and hold for a good period of time where, um, where some of these indicator species start to concentrate. You can also find uh, vernal pool-like characteristics in unnatural settings. So just sort of going clockwise from the upper left and around, you've got like a roadside ditch there. Hey, it's fishless, you know, no permanent stream. It might attract a few indicator species You've got ATV ruts going through a, a marsh system on a, a right of way. And then moving down lower right, we have a uh, basically a road impounded pool um, that's basically being caused by the, you know, there might've been a natural depression there, but the road is causing an artificial impoundment. And then a burrow or a borrow pit as Mainers call them next in the lower left. And, um, yeah, that'll work. All of these have those characteristics. The critters don't read the textbooks, so they are responding to, you know, that ephemeral fishless condition. The problem with a lot of these unnatural pools, though, is that they, some of them can al almost serve as what we call ecological traps because they are so ephemeral. They have a lot of the characteristics. They draw Critters will migrate to them, get intercepted by them, if you will, on their way to what would have been a more uh, traditional site. And then the, the, that ditch or, or roadside borrow pit or what have you might dry down even faster than a normal natural vernal pool will. And so the egg masses and larvae might get stranded. Not always. There's certainly some good quality on natural pools. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind and, and be careful about if you're trying to create one yourself. Where do they occur on the landscape? Well, the answer is pretty much anywhere. This is a sort of a generic coastal watershed in, um, you know, on, in Maine. Picture the mountains in the distance with the headwater streams uh, flowing into second order streams, flowing into rivers or great ponds and eventually to, to the ocean. And vernal pools are, are, can pretty much be found anywhere. They're up in the headwaters, they're at high elevations, they're in low elevations. They're isolated from any other water body, and sometimes they're embedded in another wetland types, like a floodplain scour pool or a or a shrub swamp, as we talked about. And so, a lot of uh, diverse settings where vernal pools can be found. So, what we're going to talk about now is just a little bit about the, you know, what what's all the hullabaloo about vernal pools. Why are they, you know, you keep hearing about them. There's quite a bit of excitement about them. Well, frankly, they are, they're just plain cool, but there's, there's also some ecological reasons why you should be concerned about um, Maine having a good diversity of intact vernal pool habitat. So just as wildlife habitat in and of itself for the indicator species, it's really invaluable. Some of these are more obligately tied to vernal pools than others, but all of them, all of the indicator species here in Maine experience their best and sort of highest breeding success in vernal pool-like settings. Um, so starting in the upper left here, we have wood frogs. Wood frogs are have like that mask on the side of the face and they can be dark brown to sort of this pale tan color, especially in females, the lighter colors. 
And they're really cool because they are the northernmost uh, distributed amphibian in North America. They get all the way up to the tree line in the tundra of, uh, of, of northern Canada and Alaska and, and, and down, of course, across all of Maine. And because of that uh, tolerance for higher latitudes and colder temperatures, they are really well adapted to, to um, the cold winters here in Maine. They actually hibernate in the uplands, not in the water like green frogs, bullfrogs and other species. They'll hibernate in the leaf litter around vernal pools and even partially, they're partially freeze tolerant. And uh, that quality allows them to, as soon as the snow melts, for the most part, and the ground begins to thaw and you get your first spring rains sort of at night above 40 degrees, 45 degrees or so, you'll get a migration of these wood frogs to the pools before any other amphibians moving for the most part. Then you have the two mole salamanders, spotted salamander and blue spotted salamander. They're called mole salamanders just because they're, they spend a lot of time underground. They're in root channels or under logs or deep in the leaf litter. So they can dig a little bit themselves, but they mostly make use of small mammal burrows and other um, you know, cavities in the earth that other creatures make and, and vegetation. And they're really cool. They have a super long life history. Wood frogs will live maybe three or four years, have one or two breeding events in their life. Mole salamanders have a whole other strategy. They're very picky about when they migrate. They may not breed every year. This year with the really staggered and sort of periodic and really low rainfall, um, some people are reporting much lower mole salamander egg mass numbers, probably because they're just foregoing uh, migration this year. It's not quite wet enough consistently and wet and warm enough. Um, and so, yeah, they, and, but, but it's okay because these guys are long lived. The spotted salamanders can live to be over 20 years. They can be picky, they can take their time and get it right. And it's just amazing that, I mean, I've been looking at these things for a long time, as you can tell by the color of my hair. And uh, it's just amazing to me that the, the color pattern on these uh, spotted salamanders is just so brash and unreal looking um, that, that nature would have created such a creature is amazing to me. They, some scientists have looked at the color patterns of spotted salamanders and to date, they, no one's found any two spotted salamanders that have identical spot patterns. You can actually tell them apart as individuals by the spot pattern. In the, in the interest of time, I'll revisit blue spotted salamanders a little later. Fairy shrimp, There's this is a crustacean. This is not an actual size picture. I wish it was, but they're only about an inch long. They're sort of the freshwater equivalent of saltwater brine shrimp or sea monkeys. Some of the older folks might remember ordering from comic books. Um, they're, they're really neat. There's, we know there's two species. There could be as many as three or four species in Maine. And if there's anything that's super close to obligate with regard to fishlessness in vernal pools, it would be fairy shrimp. They simply can't tolerate uh, fish predation of any kind. So the first guys here, the wood frog indicator species, they're what's called an explosive breeder. And that refers to that, what I started to get to, which is that, you know, they're ready to go as soon as the ground thaws and they migrate en masse to vernal pools. Southern Maine's already experienced the migration this year. Central Maine mostly has and mid-coast Maine has. And, um, you know, there's probably some colder, higher elevation pockets in central Maine that might still have some wood frogs trickling in. Northern Maine probably has not had uh, wood frog migrations yet. So it's, it depends on the local conditions, but they, they'll move on, you know, in, in all at once. The males will get down in the pools, they'll, they'll chorus, trying to draw females in. When a female comes into the pool, uh, male will will try to grab her from behind in a position that's called amplexus. And they have external fertilization where the, as the female extrudes the eggs onto a twig, like you can see in the lower right, the male um, at the moment of extrusion, not, not like in this photograph, the male will spray, uh, will fertilize the eggs as they're coming out. Try and see, yeah, Beckham put on a nice 
a recording of wood frogs. Take a listen to this. You'll have to turn up your computers. Yeah, it's pretty subtle and it's pretty subtle in the woods too. You have to be pretty much on top of a vernal pool to hear this. It's not carrying a great distance like spring peepers that you may know um, or, or even some other frog species. But that's this, I mean, it's, some people think it sounds like the like mallard ducks quacking in the woods. It sort of does. Um, and then, you know, what you're more likely to see if you're not out on a rainy night, that's still pretty cold in April and Maine. Um, but if you're walking along and visiting a vernal pool during the sunny daylight hours, a few days or weeks later, you're much more likely to see this, which is the, you know, the, the, the wood frog egg masses that they leave behind. And this, this is a whole communal raft as we speak about it. it it's a whole group of females that laid their eggs next to each other. And that's very common in the wood frogs. They leave these communal um, areas where just a couple meter, square meters where all the egg masses in the entire vernal pool might be collected for this species, for the wood frogs. So in this case, if you were counting egg masses and you, sort of, you were curious how many females visited this square meter right here, uh, you'd come up with 23 females having visited and laid eggs here. So there's a lot, and th these eggs are kind of more mature than you saw in the in the previous picture. That's because you know they're they they've been they've been there for a few days or a week or more, and and very slowly the gelatinous mass will break up and the embryos will develop and you'll get tiny tiny tadpoles that will emerge here. Spotted salamanders, um, again, just fascinating creature. I wish we had time to talk more about their life history, but. Um, whole different strategy and they are breeding. They, they have bred in Southern Maine. They are breeding actively in Central Maine still. They are a little later in their phenology than, than wood frogs generally. Um, and when they, they also, when they, when they congregate in pools, which they tend to do uh, in large groups as well, uh, relative to a particular population in an area surrounding a pool, they, they do so in a group that's often called a congress of, of salamanders, as you see here in this slide. And that's a whole bunch of males and probably a smaller number of females gathered together in one you know, corner of the pool, under the water, of course, and they're, they're air breathing as adults. And so they'll gulp air at the surface and, and, and dive back down. And the males will do elaborate courtship dances with the females that um, and slowly try to peel them away from this group by after getting the attention of a female, sort of slowly walking away and dropping spermatophores on the leaf litter, as you see on the lower right. And in, um, you know, relative to the size of the salamanders, you can see them in the white specks of the central photo as well on the leaf litter. So they're quite small, but for given the body size of the salamander, it's a huge uh, investment on the male's part. And he's only doing this after he's, you know, fairly confident that he has a female in tow. And the hope is that she will, um, there'll be internal fertilization by the female walking behind him and, and lowering herself onto one of these spermatophores, which has the sperm right at the tip of the gelatinous capsule. Again, you're more likely to see these guys than you are the animals themselves, unless you time things really well. Um, the big fist size egg masses that wood frogs and spotted salamanders leave behind. Um, so if you see a big gelatinous mass like this, you've got it, you've nailed it. You've, na you've got it down to, you know, there's 18 species of amphibians in Maine and you've narrowed it down to pretty much two, two or three. And uh, the difference, if you're interested between even these two to get it down to species is the number of embryos and the, and the jelly matrix that unifies them surrounding the, the embryos. So on the spotted salamander, you can see there's a, a pretty decent size jelly um, envelope around all of the embryos that, you know, that makes for a smooth outer surface, essentially, of the egg mass. And there's only two, three hundred embryos, typically, at most, in a, in a um, spotted salamander egg mass. Wood frogs can have up to 1,000, 1,500 embryos, 
very commonly in a single female's um, egg mass. And, and, and the embryos are all attached to each other like little marbles without that unifying jelly matrix on the outside. So that's pretty much how you tell them apart. Blue spotted salamanders, really cool creature. And in fact, in Maine, they're even cooler than, uh, than in a lot of places because we, we have pure blue spotted salamanders, meaning that you know a, a, a species that has a chromosome from the father and the mother and is a diploid organism that we are used to, um, like you and I are. But then we also have the, this group of blue spotted salamanders that are really fascinating that are, have this polyploid uh, genotype that has multiple chromosomes um, that have both the pure blue spotted um, representation and Jefferson salamander genes in them. Jefferson is a cousin of the blue sa spotted salamander in Southern New England. And we're still trying to understand the differences in ecology and appearance and movements of, of these two, but there are, there are differences. And so in effect, we have really more than uh, two species or at least two types of blue spotted salamander in Maine. And they leave behind egg masses that are similar to the spotted salamander, but also different. Um, they're similar in some cases when they lay a mass, they don't always lay a mass in the lower, like in the center bottom there, but when they do, they tend to have fewer embryos and it's much drippier. So if you were to pick that mass up, like you saw in the previous picture someone had done with a spotted salamander, this one would just drip between your fingers. You wouldn't be able to hold it firmly because the jelly matrix is so loose. Um, but they don't always lay masses, even these small masses. They sometimes just lay a few eggs attached to one another, or even singletons that quickly silt up and just roll around on the, on the, on the vernal pool bottom that you essentially, they're essentially invisible to, to us. And then fairy shrimp are another fascinating species that are part of the indicator group. Um, this is, uh, this is a female that, and she's swimming upside down and she has a forked tail, so do the males, but the female has this brood pouch that you can see in the center of her body, just below her thorax, where the thorax meets the abdomen and where you, where eggs are produced. And you can see this when fairy shrimp are sort of motoring around in the water upside down. And they, at first you might confuse them with mosquito larvae, but they're a little bigger and once you see them, you won't mistake them. You'll know it when you see them. And they're, um, they're motoring, they're moving very slowly, but they're steadily moving along using appendages that also act as breathing, essentially like gills at their, on their sides. <clears throat> and their life history is pretty neat because they, you know, they, they lay their eggs in, the, in late spring, late summer, early, early summer, before the pool dries out, the eggs then are capable of drying out. They don't have to, but in some species, it's believed that they actually need, they require drying to be activated, um, to be to, for development to proceed. And then, as they as the pools re-inundate in the fall, the eggs hatch, and then over winter, the the juveniles grow. And you can even see fairy shrimp sometimes through the ice in in late winter, early spring. Uh, on some vernal pools and certainly now as they're opening up. But it is a rare, it's, a, it's an uncommon species, a spe group of species. And, um, you know, don't get frustrated if you don't, if it takes a long time to find a, a, a vernal pool with fairy shrimp in it. And, you know, we talked about, we talk about the indicator species because that's exactly what they are. They're indicators of a healthy, vibrant, vernal pool ecosystem. And what does that mean? It means that this ecosystem is serving a lot of other species besides these four indicator species. So if you're interested in water birds and black ducks or raptors, vireos, flycatchers in the canopy over vernal pools because of the insect densities there, uh, then, you're, then, then you, you need to get excited about vernal pools. Amphibians, there's, you know, it, Half of the species of amphibians in Maine actually use vernal pools pretty regularly, um, depending on the landscape setting they're in. Um, we just don't, they just don't do so as regularly as the indicators. Nearly half of Maine's reptiles, turtles and snakes, including this ribbon snake, that's not a garter snake, that's a ribbon snake. It's a kind of an unusual species that's a semi-aquatic snake in the lower left. And then there's been some work in Massachusetts by Betsy Colburn to identify 
essentially inventory the invertebrate fauna of vernal pools. And she's found that she's got a list that's, that's over 500 species long now for the Northeast, glaciated Northeast of North America. And it, it's comprised of mollusks, uh, crustaceans like the fairy shrimp, and, and a lot of insects. This is a, a beetle larvae that you're seeing here and a dragonfly, but other insects as well, caddisflies, um, stoneflies and, and, and others. So really diverse habitats and important for some of the state's rarest and most endangered species. There's not a lot of habitats that are in Maine that host this, that are capable of hosting this diversity of of the, of the state's most at-risk species. So here we have the species on the left, their status, endangered, threatened, special concern in the middle, and their general distribution in the state, mostly Southern, but there's a couple that are statewide or central. And yeah, for, you know, by definition, these are very rare species, generally, if they're listed as endangered or threatened with just a handful of populations known often. And, as such, if they if a vernal pool is lost or filled in or, or um, developed, that can have real consequences for the local population for of these species in particular. Uh, the indicator species are you know pretty much statewide in distribution, and hopefully it'll hang in there and indicate another high value vernal pool on another day. But for these guys, it might be a big part of their entire living landscape in Maine. And some species, like the Blanding's turtle, it will even use multiple, several vernal pools within its seasonal activity period. So we've studied Blanding's turtles by putting radios on them in Maine and spotted turtles, uh, two turtles that are listed as endangered and threatened in Maine. And, and, and they, they will move around the landscape a lot. They're semi-terrestrial turtles and they use certain wetlands to forage and breed in, certain wetlands to spend the hot, dry summer period in, and then other large anchor wetlands to overwinter in. But the vernal pools tend to be the, the prime foraging wetlands. And this particular animal wove together uh, four different vernal pools within its home range in a single year that it, it visited and spent a considerable amount of time in. And, you know, even if the, if the wildlife doesn't convince you in and of itself, you probably care at least about the forest ecosystem because um, that's, Maine is essentially a forest ecosystem that we, and it serves all of us, including humans. And they play, the vernal pool indicator species play a really important role in the forest. These vernal pools are essentially food factories. They're pumping out large numbers of animals that are uh, they're visiting the spring as adults in the spring in, in the early spring right now but in this this time the, this period of time in the spring migration gets a lot of attention but outside of a couple few weeks when the adults are in the pools the rest of the year the other 90 95 percent of the calendar year they are sort of unseen unheard hundreds of feet away from the pool in the surrounding uplands in cool, moist, forested litter, closed, generally closed canopy conditions. And then later in the spring, in the, in the, as the metamorphs, as the eggs hatch and the tadpoles and tiny salamanders emerge, they will migrate out in huge numbers into the surrounding uh, landscape as well. And uh, Brian Windmiller in Massachusetts did a fascinating study actually where he circled these vernal, some vernal pools in Massachusetts and collected every adult and metamorph that was migrating to and, and out of the vernal pool and weighed them and determined that the biological mass, the collective biomass of the indicator species for some productive pools exceeded the biomass of all the vertebrate birds and uh, all the birds and mammals in the surrounding landscape of the pool in the pool so and and keep in mind that everything eats these guys <laughs> everything <laughs> just about so you know if perhaps you care a little bit more about some of the larger fuzzy things feathered things and keep in mind that mink fox kai all these guys they're they are chowing down on salamanders and wood frogs all year long not just during the migration but 
throughout the year. And, and um, even wolf spiders have been documented. So who knows how many other invertebrates are also uh, eating these creatures, but they play a very important role in the forest ecosystem in the food chain. So how do we document vernal pools? Um, that's a good question because it's tricky. They're, they're small, you know, as we sort of said by definition, they're small. So that sometimes, you know, a lot of the tools that are used for wetland identification now are used rem remotely through aerial imagery. But because vernal pools are so small, the canopy is often closed over them. And even in uh, when leaf off conditions, you might have softwoods uh, that are covering part of the pool. So it can be hard to, to identify them remotely. It can be hard to identify them on the ground, it's, you know, because they dry out. So you might be a well-intentioned landowner who vaguely recalls there's a puddle in the backwoods pretty consistently at this spot. But, you know, I finally got around to checking it out late summer. Well, it was dry. So you know, either my memory's going wrong or it's just, uh, it's not actually that valuable because it dries out, but that's precisely why it's valuable because there's a whole turnover in the whole, in the fauna associated with these systems, these flashy eph ephemeral systems that doesn't exist in the more permanent wetland systems. But it does make it challenging to document them. And so there are a couple tools. Uh, Maine Audubon has a really nice document. It's actually more up to date than the one I'm sharing here, but it is available. I just checked. You can contact the Maine Audubon Society to get an updated version of this document. Uh, Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife and Natural Heritage Program has this wonderful field guide to the animals of vernal pools. I really recommend it. You know, there's like a 95% overlap with the creatures in that in their field guide for, for here in Maine. And then at your fingertips on your computer, the if you just Google Vernal Pools University of Maine or go to this uh, URL here, um, you'll get to a site called of Pools and People that's just really rich with information. A lot of good outreach uh, spearheaded by Aram Calhoun at the University of Maine and all of her students and colleagues and uh, just really good work with tutorials, PowerPoints, um, everything you need pretty much at your fingertips to really get up to speed quickly. And, and there's a lot of other, there's a whole body of work that's developing. Um, there, you know, there's hundreds of scientific papers now, but just among, you know, some books that are relevant here in Maine, on the biological side, there's been a body of work that's growing. On the conservation and protection side, there's a body of work. And both of these uh, the, um, themes, the biology and conservation, are helping to inform our management, as you'll hear uh, later from Becca, uh, on the ground and uh, really trying to be as science-based as possible in terms of how we approach uh, what the protection needs are for vernal pools. So back to documentation, the, the timing is now. It's uh, sort of, de but it, as I said, it really, to, to fine tune this, you'd have to, it would depend on where you are in the state. Could be as late, as, as early as late March in Southern Maine in some years, or, or you know, spotted salamanders might, might not migrate and breed until uh, late May, early June in extreme Northern Maine in some years. So, but for the most part, most of the state, April and May would be the timing of wood frog and mole salamander migrations and um, when you could actually you know, start to see and count egg masses in the pools, you'll wanna get out in the pool. It's tempting to sort of walk around the edge with your sneakers or muck boots, but that won't do it because you're gonna miss, you know, what, remember what I told you, these three individuals here are looking for that one square meter in the pool where the mother load of wood frogs have all laid their eggs. And um, spotted salamanders, not so much. Blue spots, they'll spread their eggs out, but wood frogs, generally really concentrated in one spot. Helps to do it on a sunny day, actually. Um, you'd think the reflection, would, but the, the sun penetrates better. It's, there's more reflection on overcast days. Um, you wanna record what you're observing. You wanna record it with a camera as well. Um, and, and it often does take more than one visit because remember the biology and the phenology is such that the wood frogs may do their migration first Often they do, and then that would be followed uh, generally by uh, the mole salamanders, uh, perhaps the blue spots first, and then the spotted's next. 
And, this, and, and the mole salamanders will trickle in. They, we hear about a big night event. You'll hear more about that later, but it's very often a multiple night event. And especially for the salamanders because they are so picky about the conditions under which they'll migrate. And of course, you, you, sh you, you should always get landowner permission um, before entering a vernal pool. They are, vernal pools are small enough that they are privately owned in their entirety by whosoever property they're on. Of course, you're gonna to need to also keep your eye out for these guys come late, you know, come mid to late summer, early fall, because vernal pools very often dry out. I say very often because they don't always dry out. You can have semi-permanent vernal pools that are also fishless, and those are actually really valuable. That long hydro period, they tend to be larger, deeper sometimes, and can host larger populations of the indicator species, but it's a slippery slope because if semi-permanent starts to move towards permanent, then you get a lot more predators eventually occupying that pool. And then it just, it can wipe out the indicators. In any case, you, you want to be able to, you want to look for a break in the canopy. Um, you know, that's often a sign that you'll, you'll get a topographic depression on the ground. Um, you might have water stains on the trees bordering the pool basin or, or in the leaves uh, right out in the pool you'll see a difference in the plants growing. You'll see, you know, you'll just, even if you don't recognize uh, individual uh, wetland obligate plants, or, uh, you'll, you'll be able to tell that this is, something's different is going on right here than the rest of the forest understory that I just walked through. This place looks like it's wet sometimes. I think you'll probably get that gestalt in most cases. And then you can also look under logs and leaf litter for the actual casings and shells of snails, fingernail clams, caddisfly cases, and other signs of, of life. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Becca to finish up with talking to you about vernal pool conservation and some of the tools that we use as an agency to protect these really special places. Awesome, thank you, Philip. Um, sharing. All right. <clears throat> uh, so thank you, Philip, for introducing vernal pools and really describing them to us. Um, now I wanna talk about vernal pool conservation and what we're doing in the state to protect them. Um, so I'm really gonna focus on the two things highlighted in green, um, but I'm also gonna to touch on the other topics um, in white. So uh, first off, for regulatory protection, uh, IFNW works really closely with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection to help protect these vernal pools. Um, Maine is really special in the sense because only a handful of states have these regulations set in place um, where these vernal pools can get protected. And these regulations were put in place in Maine in 2007. Um, and they really help to protect these high value pools, which I'll talk about later. Uh, for fee acquisition and easements, IFNW has a significant vernal pool um, GIS map layer that we have that's public facing and the beginning with Habitat Group at IFNW uses this to send to towns and land trusts and they use these to better plan what they're going to be doing with the town and um, what land to purchase to conserve these areas. And so this really encourages these towns to, uh, again, conserve these areas, and then also to be more proactive and less reactive. So the idea is that they can purchase these properties that these significant vernal pools exist, um, or they can also, um, we have a lot of other mapped habitats that are important that aren't just vernal pools. And so um, uh, in combination with the vernal pools, they can purchase land that covers both of these areas. Um, and again, it can protect a whole lot of wildlife habitat. Um, so in addition to that, um, pretty similar municipal planning is something that all towns have to do. And so all towns have these uh, comprehensive planning um, uh, things that they do annually. And so again, they work with the beginning uh, with Habitat Group um, and they use the, our data um, and they use our habitat layers to consider these areas for future development. So the idea is that they're avoiding these areas um, that have significant vernal pools and again, other mapped habitats. And so construction uh, BMPs, uh, construction best management practices are, um, uh, these are things that are used from land trusts and foresters, and they'll work with us um, if they have these significant burn pools on their property. So um, uh, by, oops, sorry, one second. Um, so, uh, so say they wanna use these for educational purposes, they'll work with us about signage they can put up, um, or they'll work on managing these areas um, just to protect the pools and leave them alone themselves. 
So foresters will also do this, um, but vernal pools are not regulated through forestry practices. And so the last big thing is uh, public education, citizen science and outreach. So outreach was and still is really crucial um, as in uh, tonight, it's in crucial in raising awareness for the importance of these pools and for protecting them. Um, and I'm gonna wrap up with uh, what you can do to help if you're really excited and jazzed about vernal pools after this talk. So previously, vernal pools uh, were slightly protected under the Maine Natural Resource Protection Act of 1988. Um, freshwater wetlands were protected through the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and this really helped to protect a lot of the bigger wetlands throughout the state. The only problem was a lot of these vernal pools, as Philip mentioned, are pretty small, less than an acre in size. So a lot of times these were falling through the cracks um, and they weren't getting protected from development um, projects. Um, so uh, a sad example of this is a, a pool that was in New York, Maine, and it um, hosted a great population of spotted turtles. Um, and it was quite productive. And again, this was before any regulations were set in place other than the Wetland Protection Act. Um, and because it was so small, it really fell through the cracks. Um, and unfortunately, um, after three years, it, it ceased to exist because of development purposes. Um, another example of why we needed more vernal pool regulations is because the upland area adjacent to these vernal pools wasn't, um, didn't have as many protections as it, it could have had. So Philip has been talking about how um, these vernal pool depressions themselves are really important and how the upland areas adjacent to them are also really important because a lot of times um, the amphibians will breed out of these uh, vernal pools into these upland areas and they'll use both habitats equally. Um, so uh, previously uh, subdivisions could be built pretty close up to these vernal pools and a lot of times these um, forested upland areas could be eliminated. eliminated. <clears throat> So um, this all led to um, the significant vernal pool regulations that were established in 2007. So this page uh, really just demonstrates the variety of different um, significant wildlife habitat regulations under the Natural Resource Protection Act. Um, and this last one in red is a significant vernal pool one established in 2007. So uh, these regulations set in place were really uh, in order to help not only the vernal pool depressions that were really small, but also the upland areas adjacent to them. So for, uh, Philip has been talking about vernal pools in general, and I want to touch on the ones that we regulate. So we're really only regulating a high value subset of these vernal pools. Um, again, as Philip was saying, they're smaller, they're seasonal, um, there's no fish, and then the significant vernal pools, they have to be natural, they can't be human made. So Philip showed pictures of skitter ruts, ATV ruts, um, gravel pits, uh, stuff like that. Those are not considered significant vernal pools just because they weren't naturally occurring on the landscape. They also have to meet uh, an egg mass uh, threshold. So for wood frogs, you need about 40 egg masses, spotted salamanders, 20, blue spotted, 10, and then you need to have um, fairy shrimp, which are those cool crustaceans you were showing earlier. Um, uh, or they could also have rare species. So these would be you know, spotted turtles, blanding turtles, ribbon snakes, um, a couple species of dragonflies. Um, but more often than not, than not they're triggered significant from the wood frog egg masses and the spotted salamander egg masses. I review a lot of these pools and every now and then we'll see some with rare species, but for the most part, um, it's a lot of egg masses that make them significant vernal pool, and which gives the, the protections under the, the significant vernal pool regulations from 2007. So in order to get this information, um, IFNW created these uh, vernal pool field forms that we, uh, we provide out on our website and developers will use these when they're surveying their land and they're trying to develop a project and they have to check for vernal pools first. So we have these vernal pool forms um, where they fill out information about where the pool is, GPS coordinates, they give us shape files of the actual, um, the footprint of the pool so we know where it is in our, um, our, our database. And then they also uh, provide other features such as the surrounding vegetation, um, and then egg mass numbers. And then they'll submit these forms to us and we'll review them. And then we can determine significance and, significance, and then we can protect them based on these findings. So IFNW has been working closely with the Maine Department of Environmental Protection and we've been mapping the surveyed pools um, since these regulations were put in place in 2007. So this map here is a map of all the pools that have been surveyed throughout the state. Um, so the green ones represent significant pools, the red not significant, and the yellow are potentially, um, usually we need a little bit more information on these pools. So as you can see, only about 20 to 25% of these um, pools mapped throughout the state are significant. Um, and this number has stayed steady since about 2007. It fluctuates a little bit, um, but for the most part, uh, only about a quarter of them are significant once they're surveyed. So unlike other mapped habitats um, uh, throughout the state, we have deer wintering areas mapped, we have 
uh, significant vernal pools map. We've got um, inland uh, waterfowl wading bird habitats map. These ones are different because um, these ones are not pre-mapped. Uh, these ones come in as we survey them or as developers survey them for projects. So some towns will do uh, town-wide surveys for these pools and they'll um, determine what pools are in their town. But a lot of times it's usually just development projects surveying the land for vernal pools. So from this map, it looks like there's a whole lot going on in Southern Maine and not much in Northern Maine. And that's just because there's a lot more development in the Southern portion of the state. So those areas are surveyed for vernal pools. Northern Maine, a little bit less development. So we don't have as many records for pools, even though um, we know they're there. Um, so again, this map is not representative of all the significant vernal pools or the vernal pools of the state of Maine. It's really just the ones that have been surveyed. Uh, so I also work with the Environmental Review Team, the IFNW, and we've seen well over 6,000 projects since the inception of our database in 2012. And out of all of these projects, we've only had about 140 hits on significant vernal pools. So these development project footprints have only um, intercepted about 140 pools, which is about 2% of all the development projects that we've seen. Again, that number is probably a bit higher um, because uh, survey forms come into us a little bit later and the permits come in sometimes. Um, but the point is, a lot of times when these development projects come in, they'll do their best to avoid these pools because um, they realize that they're significant, uh, they're significant features in the landscape. Um, all right, so when these projects do intersect with significant vernal pools, we do provide recommendations um, and suggestions for habitat management. So first off, we, we suggest they stay out of the vernal pool depression. Um, it's kind of highlighted in blue here, and that's where we recommend no construction whatsoever. Now this green circle on the outside is a critical, critical terrestrial habitat, which is about 250 feet out from the pool. And so in this habitat, they can impact up to 25% of that habitat. So we like to maintain about a 75% unfragmented forest surrounding this frontal pool depression. I'll get into a little bit more, but this 250 foot buffer is really important for amphibian species. Um, we try to protect, protect it as much as possible, but again, we can allow up to 25% conversion of this habitat. Um, again, this is different from forest management. Um, these aren't really regulated um, uh, in this manner. Uh, so there's other exemptions as well, but forestry is um, one of the big ones where they don't have to follow these regulations. So if this is all confusing. Here's an example that might make it a little bit um, more clear. So we get a lot of subdivisions um, and permit form from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and, ex and for this one, this would be a 10 lot subdivision that uh, came through DEP and they found a significant vernal pool on the Eastern portion of their parcel. Um, so as proposed right now, lot five would completely decimate the significant vernal pool um, and the critical terrestrial habitat surrounding it. So what we would recommend is eliminating one of the lots, making it a nine lot subdivision. And then they'd still be impacting part of the critical terrestrial habitat, as you can see in purple, um, but it would be under 25% of this habitat. Uh, so in our, in our book, they did a great job um, avoiding the significant vernal pool and they still get to have their subdivision. So it's a win-win situation. So as I was saying, um, this 250 foot zone is really important. Um, it's outlined in red here and um, <clears throat> Uh, so the, the animals that are using this pool, wood frogs, spotted salamanders, Jefferson salamanders, represented in these green buffers, they, you can see they go a lot farther than this 250 foot buffer. Um, and this map represents an average of those ranges. So the numbers on the bottom are kind of an average, a uh, maximum, how far away these animals are getting from this pool. So we know we're not capturing everything with this 250 foot buffer of protection, um, but it's still really valuable to the species. So about half of spotted salamander and wood frog adults will overwinter in this 250 foot critical terrestrial habitat surrounding the vernal pool depression. Um, and metamorphs, when they hatch out of this pool, they will congregate and utilize the zone after, um, again, after they hatch out of, uh, out of the egg masses. So we're aware that we can't protect the full migration window of this or the full migration zone of all these green buffers, um, but we do protect a really important part of this breeding habitat within this 250 foot zone. Um, so that was all the regulatory um, things that we do to protect them. And so there are ways that citizens can also get involved in protecting these um, the vernal pools and the creatures that inhabit them. So if you're excited about vernal pools and you're still here, um, you might be interested in big night, which is our next topic. So big night is a term uh, used to refer to uh, this big, mi big migration. It's a sim simultaneous migration of amphibians um, where they're leaving their uh, their breeding areas, their wintering areas, and they're coming out and they're um, moving to vernal pools and they're moving to forested upland areas and they're getting ready to breed and lay eggs. 
So the triggers for this night are in spring. Um, so for May, that's gonna be mid-April. Um, it's usually a rainy night, so they can pass these uh, impervious surfaces such as roads to get uh, varying habitats. And it's usually about 45 degrees Fahrenheit um, with a thawed ground. So the reason why volunteers are really important in helping for this big night event is that a lot of times uh, these species will be leaving these forested upland areas, these wetland areas, and they'll be going to different uh, vernal pools to lay their eggs. So a lot of times roads will bisect these habitats. And so uh, more often than not, road mortality is a problem. And um, if you've ever been driving on an April night, um, it's raining, you may see mass amounts of frogs hopping across the road. And um, so this is the big night movement when they're moving across. And again, it's not just one night, it happens several nights throughout the state. There was, there was one last night, um, I believe in Frankfurt, um, one of our uh, RAI uh, members, uh, sorry, our herpetologist, uh, said that he'd seen a bunch of species crossing the roads. Um, so, and there's supposed to be another one, I, I think on Sunday as well. They happen all throughout, um, all throughout April. And so we're not done yet, we've missed some of them, but they're not completely done. So volunteers will go out on these nights and they'll help these uh, species cross the roads. Um, and they'll also record numbers of species crossing the roads just so we have a better idea of um, where these species are uh, moving. So um, this works um, by uh, potential sites getting uh, detected. So this is where these, uh, essentially these hot spots are happening where all these big mass movements are happening. Volunteers then get trained and certified. Um, you take a quick training online, um, 20 minutes to two hours, pass a quiz, sign a waiver, and then you can adopt some sites near you. And you can go out and you can uh, help these amphibians cross the road and um, prevent them from getting hit by cars. And then you can also uh, you collect this data and then report it back um, so we have a better idea of uh, the number of species that are moving at this time and what days. So if this excites you and you wanna get out and help some uh, amphibians, there's a bunch of different things you can do. So there's a Facebook group um, that's headed up by Greg LeClaire. It's one of our colleagues out of UMaine, Maine. Um, and he helps organize a bunch of volunteer events where you go out and um, they have these nights set aside and you look for these amphibians crossing the road and you help them cross the road and you record these numbers. There's also a website. Um, his contact information is also listed here that he was happy to share. And then also a Twitter account. Um, again, and thank you to Greg LeClaire for providing all this information for Big Night. All right, and at this point, I'm gonna hand it back over to Philip for acknowledgements. Yeah, thank you, Becca. So yeah, we're, we're pretty much all done, folks. I just, it's important to point out that the vast majority of photographs that we shared tonight were not taken by Becca or myself. And, um, and that everything that we do as an agency with vernal pools, uh, whether it be non-regulatory or regulatory, is closely coordinated with several agency partners and NGOs that you see there. Um, and finally, I just wanna make a point that it, vernal pools are the work that Becca and I do uh, on vernal pools and that others do with non-game and endangered species at Maine Department of Fish and Wildlife is funded in large part by uh, proceeds from the sale of loon license plates. And also on the state income tax form, there's a chickadee checkoff. And those two rather modest, uh, not very often advertised sources of in-state funding are critical for leveraging as match to leverage state wildlife grants from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So in combination, that's how we get uh, a lot of the non-game and endangered species work done in the state and certainly a lot of the vernal pool work. Thank you very much. I think we're gonna open it up for questions. All right, thank you very much both to uh, Philip and Becca for this wonderful presentation tonight. So we will go ahead and take some of your questions. A few have been coming in. Um, it's been a pretty active chat throughout. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started and ask a couple of questions. And if any of you have more questions as we're going, please go ahead and write them in the chat um, and we will try to get to as many as we can. So to start us off, um, there one of our one of our first questions was, are wood frogs edible, and are you allowed to eat them? <laughs> you want me to take that one, Becca? <laughs> uh, so, would I have no idea? <laughs> I've never even thought about eating them, and probably wouldn't try, even if you told me they were edible. But I 
I want I suspect I suspect uh, it's possible they're edible um, and it would be technically permissible to collect a wood frog and eat it. Let's make that a little broader because I'm suspecting a lot of the audience doesn't have an interest in eating them, but might be just sort of interested in the basic question. Can you collect a few amphibians from the wild for personal whatever use, you know, as a pet in a terrarium for nature study? So, you know, I know when I was a kid, I brought tons of critters home. And, and so the answer is yes, you can, um, but there's limits to it. We have uh, in, in law, there's, uh, I think you're allowed up to five individuals of any common amphibian or rep, uh, sorry, any common amphibian species and up to two individuals of any common reptile species. Anything beyond that you'd need a permit for and we would look at the reasons you needed that. So I don't, I think if they are edible, you're gonna get hungry without a permit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and just to, to clarify for people that just to be, be cautious about uh, what protected species there are out there, of course, and you can learn more information off of, uh, off of our website about those different species um, or call if you have questions. <laughs> um, another question is, can a vernal pool be created by people and uh, will it be just, will it be as effective as a natural one? Sometimes. Um, absolutely, you can create them, but, you know, it's not a case of if you build it, they will come necessarily. They, um, you really, it's, it's actually pretty difficult to simulate the hydrology of a vernal pool in that, that you know, that's that ephemeral to semi-permanent condition that holds water long enough for the animals to go through their whole egg and larval development but doesn't hold water so long as to support fish or other uh, aquatic predators. So that, that can be a little tricky, but I've seen it done well and it can happen with some study. And there's even a couple um, sort of BMP books online and guidance documents that, that are there to help teach you how to build one. And I know a colleague with, at IFMW that very successfully built a vernal pool without probably even trying to in his garden. Um, by his home in Brunswick, so it can be done. That is, that is interesting to, to think about. So any uh, budding landowners or landowners interested in those kinds of things, there is hope or maybe you already have one out there. Um, and on, on that note, somebody was wondering, are, are vernal pools typically the same size year to year or does it depend on rainfall? Um, they are typically the same size. I would say that the, you know, that they're really defined mostly by the depression and the contours, the local topography of the pool basin. But, but the the amount of rainfall is important more so as to how long the pool stays wet. You know, so how how many days, how many weeks, and so in a really and that's important in a really dry year like we had last year, and like we might be shaping up to have this year. I hope not, but it's. Uh, it's been a very dry spring. Uh, it, it can lead to exceedingly ephemeral pools that, and these, keep in mind, we didn't quite touch on this, but these animals are really faithful to, um, not a hundred percent, but but people, but, but very faithful to the pools they were born in. So they're, you know, and so I, I, it depends on the study you look at, but they range from something like 80 to 90% fidelity to the natal pools, depending on which species you look at. And um, that means they're, you know, they're, they're partially hardwired to go back to that place where they were born from, which makes sense because obviously they don't have perfect information on the landscape. And if they successfully bred in that pool, um, it's the best information they have to, and that's where they'll go back. But if, if conditions change from when they were born, say droughts get worse and worse, um, it, it can lead to local extirpation of a population for sure. Yeah, on that note, actually, there was actually a question about um, how, how long it takes uh, salamander and wood frog eggs to develop, but to, to become, you know, from tadpole all the way up to adult, how long does that process take for them? Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty quick for wood frogs. Um, it's the, the egg masses will hatch in 
anywhere from two to four weeks, depending on the, you know, generally three weeks, but somewhere in that range, uh, depending on the temperatures and the, and the depth of the water, which affects temperature and the openness of the canopy. And, and then they'll, I'd have to calculate it, but basically midsummer is when you're gonna see, you know, uh, Southern Maine, late June, Central Maine, July, you're gonna have wood frog metamorphs emerging from the pools. Salamander's much longer. So instead of like uh, three or four weeks for egg masses to hatch, it would be closer to like six or seven weeks, uh, even eight weeks in colder pools. And then also a much longer larval period with salamanders, mole salamanders generally emerging late, late summer, early fall, like September-ish. So they tend to need a, a longer hydro period pool than wood frogs. And fairy shrimp, very short. They have a really short, fast life cycle and can be successful in super flashy ephemeral pools that are only inundated for a couple months. Yeah, that's real. It's really interesting that life cycle is very different from some of our other frog species. Um, so on that note, somebody's actually wondering, can you move egg masses if you find them in a vernal pool and uh, that's like almost drying out, can you move them from one to another? And is that a good idea? Yeah, I'm glad you added that second question. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> you certainly can. And, you know, there wouldn't be anything illegal about it. I don't think you know, I don't want to give it like a single answer because everything's so case specific, you know, but generally I understand totally your, your sentiment who's asking this because I've asked myself this question as well. But um, generally I shy away from doing that because I feel like, you know, they've evolved in this landscape for thousands of years. Um, and Yes, the climate is changing and conditions sometimes change as a result of land use and development around the pool. But if you're in a fairly um, natural setting, I think it'd be a little presumptuous to, to second guess that the, that the drying event that you're witnessing is somehow way out of the ordinary or unnatural because we just don't have enough of a frame of reference. And keep in mind that the wood frogs and mole salamanders, the, the ones we're talking about, are fairly common species too. Again, they're indicator species. So while very closely tied to these pools, um, you know, we're not risking the loss of uh, their population statewide because of a couple, of, you know, because of a handful of pools that are just steadily getting drier and drier. Right. No, that's that's definitely good information. We, we've all probably seen it at some point, those rental pools getting getting low and you're rooting for the eggs. <laughs> um, on that note, I was wondering, is there an ideal or average depth to vernal pools? Um, not really. Uh, you know, that it's true that I think it's generally true. I don't really have data to prove this, that the deeper your pool, the the longer the hydro period, but it's not always true. You might think that's just sort of a truism, but it's not because it really depends on the drainage of the soils in the area. You can have well-drained sandy gravelly soils in fairly deep pools that uh, disappear relatively quickly without additional rainfall um, and vice versa. So, but so no, there isn't like an ideal depth. I, I suppose on the other end of the continuum, one could approach it could say that there is a threshold where say if you're in a pool in the spring now when it's basically high water and it's not it's supposed to be high water now right with snow melt and spring rain and if you're in a pool now and 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 it's not and it's less than a foot deep it's it's I, more often than not it's not going to hold water long enough to support the life history of the amphibians it might work for the fairy shrimp, though. Yeah, that, that's all, it's all really interesting. It'd be interesting to see how the spring goes with getting more rain or, or whatnot to help out these, these different pools. Um, going along with that, there is a question about, so uh, how does an interrupted significant vernal pool, um, you know, how does it get restarted? So if, like if it dries out for, for a while, how, how, will, how long or how can it get re restarted if it misses a year or... Um, 
Yeah, so I, I might rephrase the question if just sort of make sure I understand it, but I think what they're asking is, you know, if a pool is unsuccessful one year, how can it be successful another year? And if so, how? And I think for two reasons, one, these animals, you know, uh, wood frogs, you know, this hasn't been studied in Maine, but it's been studied in a couple other places that have latitudes and climates similar to Maine. And we think wood frogs often breed twice, yeah, have two chances in Maine's, in Maine's climate. Um, so that might not always be true for wood frogs. So it, they probably have more on the line, but, you know, so if you had two years in a row, you could wipe out really a whole cohort and um but but the the caveat on that is that i talked about high site fidelity but it's not perfect and so you do get sort of these wandering pioneers in every population these metamorphs that disperse and they don't just hang out and return to the natal pool they just keep dispersing and start a home range elsewhere on the landscape and occupy other pools and um and so you know, over time, if that depression starts to become productive again and holds water, you're likely to get recolonized by some of those dispersers from as long as you're not too far away from other pools on the landscape. And then for salamanders, it's not a problem because they're so long lived. So if it's dry for a couple of years, they'll just, you know, turn away, go back into their uh, shrew burrow and wait it out and come back the next year, go back, wait it out. Five years later, they can start, they can breed again. And so, you know, they're really long lived and have that ability. Uh, this is great. Thank you. Um, so we're going to take just a couple more questions just in the uh, interest of time, but we will try to get to a couple more. Um, there was a question about um, macro invertebrates and someone was wondering what different species of macro invertebrates might you find in a vernal pool? Yeah, so macro invertebrates is, is, is a ter just means larger invertebrates. Um, so um, like most of the, something you can hold in the palm of your hand and sort of see without a lens, <laughs> if you wanna just put it in real basic terms. And um, so the, there's sort of three groups that are really the most common macro invertebrate groups in vernal pools. One are crustaceans. And there's a whole bunch of different orders of them. You know, fairy shrimp are the ones we've been talking quite a bit a lot about, but copepods, amphipods, daphnia, and, and others that I'm not thinking of right now, but it's a, it's a diverse group and they very often do occur in vernal pool settings. Um, mollusks, like the little tiny fingernail clams, which are really neat. Uh, there's, a, there's many, several species of them. Uh, snails, both air breathing and um, lunged snails uh, will occupy uh, vernal pools. And that would be the sort of the second group, what we call the mollusks. And then the third group of macro invertebrates that's probably the most diverse um, of them all in vernal pools would be, the, would be insects. So um, caddisflies, dragonflies, beetles are really three big, very diverse groups in vernal pools, but there are um, there are other insect groups as well. That is a very fun list of different invertebrates to find out of vernal pool. So I'm ready to get out there and go check these out even closer. Um, and someone was wondering, is there a way to see a list based by town of the different um, uh, vernal pools in Maine? Because they are wondering if one of the, a couple of the vernal pools near them has actually been surveyed. Yeah, I'm going to turn this one over to Becca, and I'm also going to apologize for having answered a lot of the questions, but Becca got bumped off the, the line, but she's back on, but she's following, and she's on a little bit of a lag, but if everyone will just pause a moment, I think she'll be able to answer that question. Just 
Yep. Sorry about that. My, uh, my audio is off my laptop. So I'm listening on YouTube. It's about 10 seconds off. Um, so we do, we actually have, um, these rental pools listed throughout the state. Um, there's a program with IFMW called beginning with habitat. Um, and they have all of the habitats mapped throughout the state of Maine. So this is, you know, a lot of other habitats, but significant vernal pools are also on there. Um, and you can go through and you can filter by your town and you can either get uh, digital copies if you're uh, tech savvy and have GIS, or you can also print off these PDF maps um, where you can search the vernal pools in your town and see if there's anything near you that you can come check out. Um, but also be careful, um, make sure that you have you know, either landowner permissions or they're on uh, public land trust that you can go to and uh, don't uh, encroach on anybody's property that isn't ready for you. No, oh, that's great. And it's always fun to try to explore these places, but we do want to remind people always make sure you have a landowner permission or it's in public space. Um, another question that we that we had came in al along the same lines was if somebody um, sees a vernal pool that's been destroyed, they were just wondering if there are repercussions and if they should check in um, or and or report um, if they see such activity with a known vernal pool in their area. So again, people are looking out for that wildlife, but I think we'll let uh, Becca take that again. I think she's on a little bit of a delay, so um, we'll just we'll just wait a second. So that's a good question. Um, so we work closely with DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, to protect these pools. Um, so they work a lot with, um, we call it after the fact permitting. So uh, things that happen that maybe shouldn't have happened. So um, DEP is usually the better point of contact for these types of instances if a pool has been destroyed after the fact. Um, you can also reach out to us too and we can connect you to the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, uh, either way, uh, uh, there are steps that you can take, but a lot of it's involved with the environmental protection because um, a lot of the jurisdiction lies with them. That's great, thank you. And we just have two more questions for tonight, um, but always feel free to um, reach out to us through our, our website or online if you have more questions later. Um, so we do have one question here. Uh, how is the main amphibian population being affected by the Kitchard and Rana virus? This, so yeah, that that's a good question, and for the for others that are still on and listening, those uh, the chytrid fungus and ranavirus are two of the most prevalent amphibian diseases, uh, really in the in the country, in in and even worldwide, and certainly here in Maine as well. Um, they there hasn't been a lot of work done in Maine. There's been some though. And it seems as though the um, ranavirus is the more um, lethal of the two. It has, you know, when we when you see large die-offs of or hear about them, even if you don't see them, of course, it like it often happens in in uh, among frogs in either longer hydro period vernal pools or, or indeed ponds and and, and, and lakes often with green frogs and bullfrogs, more so green. And ranavirus well, can wipe out, it's just highly contagious and can wipe out a large population really quickly. Um, chytrid fungus has done, has devastated amphibians worldwide. It's probably one of the leading factors why amphibians as a vertebrate uh, class are more at risk and endangered worldwide than, than any other group um, because it's led to many, not, not just declines, but extinctions of species worldwide. And, and actually the very first chytrid fungus uh, um, taxonomy work and, and identification work was done right here in Maine by uh, uh, Dr. Longcore in, at, uh, at um, University of Maine, Orono. And so, but for you know, for this apparently for this, 
the species that we have here in Maine, I am not aware of chytrid fungus having caused uh, widespread die-offs or extensive mortality. It seems as though uh, the species that are here in Maine, and keep in mind our diversity is pretty low compared to a lot of places in the world for amphibians, um, are fairly resilient to chytrid fungus. But that's only at the at the at the sort of mortality level. In other words, there could be sublethal effects that we're completely not detecting or aware of, and certainly it's not a question I've studied. So I, I wouldn't go any I wouldn't go out on a limb any more than I already have. No, that that's good information to know, and it's it's nice to know that people are aware of of these issues facing our different amphibian species. So that was a great question. Thank you. And Laura, um, Laura, yeah. let me just sorry. I'll just follow up by saying. You know, this this sort of ties back to that question about moving animals or egg masses between pools. That's probably that's another concern that you can't see ranavirus very well, and you can't see chytrid fungus unless you're looking at the skin of an amphibian under a microscope. And and yet we know it's widespread in the state, and it can. Um, if, when it builds up to certain levels, and for some species, it can be a really devastating uh, phenomenon. So moving creatures between pools risks moving, you know, introducing disease from a contaminated area to an uncontaminated one. And that disease can also uh, be carried by your boots, by the silt and mud on your soles of your feet. And so as biologists, we, we are very careful to bleach, use a bleach solution on our uh, gear when we move between fernal pools or at the very least between watersheds. And so just something to keep in mind when you, as to why it wouldn't be a good idea to move things between water bodies. Um, I'm very glad you, you mentioned that uh, amphibians, since they have that porous skin, can be really susceptible to a lot of um, different things, even sometimes things that you may just put on your hands. So if you're going out to pick up or, or help survey amphibians, in fact, if you if you go to the uh, Big Night webpage, which I'll put that in the chat again, um, as part of the training, there's some information about just handling amphibians um, as well to help keep them safe with their special skin. So, so there were two more questions. Again, I don't this will let be the last two this time. Um, but we'll ask the first one and then and then we'll end with one more. So there was a question about invasive plants. Do vernal pools suffer from any sort of invasive plant issues um, that might make them vulnerable? Yeah, I mean the, the whole there's a, a a really high percentage of the Flora in Maine, unfortunately, is comprised of exotic plants that aren't that shouldn't be here. A subset of those exotic plants are what we call invasive plants. They once they get hold of some terrain and start a population, they can spread quite rapidly and really um, so uniformly and rapidly that they can usurp living space from other species and. It does happen in wetland settings. I don't know of any sort of vernal pool specific specialist invasive plants, but there are, I, I do know, you know, some of the wetland invasives of Maine that we need to be careful about do invade vernal pools as well. So like purple loosestrife, um, where are some others? And, um, yellow, giant yellow iris. It's a beautiful iris, but it doesn't belong here. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not a botanist, but there are lots of um, wetland invasive plants. And, you know, we, that's another, that's sort of, you can of course see plants. They're not like disease, amphibian disease, but again, they're, they're propagules, the seeds and the pollen and the gametes of, of uh, invasive plants can be transported inadvertently between, you know, water bodies. So it would be another reason to be really careful. Right. So if you do plan to do any vernal pool exploring, you know, maybe just be really cautious and, and look up ways that you can help keep them, 
keep them safe. And if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out and ask. Um, we definitely encourage people to, to, to ask if they, if they are unsure of something. All right, so last question for the evening before we wrap it up. Um, do all salamanders lay eggs in vernal pools or some kind of water? Or should I say all are salamanders in Maine, not the entire world? <laughs> uh, no, no. So we have, there's nine species, I think. I did double check. I'm pretty sure there's nine species of salamander in Maine, 18 species of amphibian, you know, so half frogs and toads, half salamanders. And the the two species, the indicators for vernal pools do always lay eggs in the, or the the th yeah, the two, the spotted and blue spotted always lay eggs in, in, in water. But there's other uh, strategies by other species. There are stream salamanders. We have three species of stream salamanders and they too lay their eggs in streams in the water. But we have um, redback salamanders, actually. The most common salamander, the most common amphibian, in fact, the most common vertebrate in the state of Maine is a two or three inch long creature called the redback salamander, which in New Hampshire and some studies just across the border has been determined to be at densities of something like one animal per square meter of, uh, of mature forest. So in the leaf litter, so they're just really abundant. They're out there. I mean, I've, most people have probably encountered them lifting logs and stuff, but uh, certainly not at that density because they're down in the leaf litter. They they lay their egg, they have an entirely terrestrial life history. They lay their eggs under moist logs, and the females actually tend the nests of the redback salamander nests, and will keep fungus and other critters from eating them. Um, and for just I'll just give one other example of sort of a hybrid approach. Four toed salamanders are pretty cool. They will lay their eggs uh, in a terrestrial sphagnum setting a sphagnum hummock or mossy mound above the water in it so technically terrestrial but in but the eggs are laid right on the edge of the mound in, in a fashion that as they hatch the, the the little tiny larvae wriggle free of the moss and fall into the water so they have a terrestrial egg stage and a terrestrial adult stage but an aquatic um larval stage yeah. Oh, thank you. That's really fascinating. There's a, a lot of different uh, amphibians out there. Um, and I just want to put a plug out there that if you do find some kind of amphibian um, in your area, if you want to snap a picture of it and submit it through iNaturalist, it can be a part of a um, ongoing survey that's happening right now called the Maine Amphibian and Reptile Atlas Project. Um, so iNaturalist is a great um, app for gathering information for citizen science. Um, so I would highly encourage that as well. Well, I just want to thank both Becca and Philip for joining us tonight. It was a real pleasure to have you guys with us. And this was a really fascinating topic and people seem to really be enjoying themselves. Um, so thank you again, both of you for joining us. Uh, I do want to just remind everybody, we do have some more upcoming presentations tomorrow morning at 9.30. Please join us for Coffee with MDIFW as we speak with um, Land Owner Relations Corporal Dave Shabbat. And then next week on April 28th at 7 p.m., we'll have a presentation with our moose biologist, Lee Cantar, about managing Maine's moose. So again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Philip and Becca, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we hope you all have fun out there and enjoy the 